uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been um, spending a lot of time talking about the vision uh, that God has given to us and, and believing God for uh, some really big things that are um, in our future, things that we really believe God is, is raising us up as a local church. Um, we shared our big picture vision that by 2028, we will saturate our backyard. Our backyard is a 20 mile radius of our church. By 2028, we will saturate our backyard by providing churches to shift culture into finding its place in God's story. I believe with all my heart that as a people, as we will lean upon God and lean upon one another, God can do extraordinary things through us. I believe that we are better together, amen? I think as we will trust God together and believe God for big things. I think sometimes we, we fail to believe God for big things. I think sometimes our view of God can be very, very small. And so our ask of God becomes very, very small. But I wanna tell you that God is bigger than we could ever imagine. God has resources and means that, that go far beyond our, our expectations. And if he could only have a people who can believe him to do the extraordinary, God will do that very thing through our lives. And so we do believe that by 2028, we're gonna saturate our backyard by providing churches to shift culture and to finding its place in God's story. Some might say that's a, that's a really big ask. That's a, that's a really lofty goal. Some might even say a little too lofty. How is the church going to shift culture? How are we going to provide enough churches to saturate our backyard with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How are we going to hit our metrics? Remember our metrics we talked about. What was our, our metrics? Our, our metrics are to revive Christianity in our backyard to see people get a hold of the God who loves them and has a plan and purpose for their lives, to revive Christianity, to, to reestablish the core of the homes, and then to reinvest in our communities. How are we going to see that happen? How in the world can we possibly, given the limited resources and the limited time that we have in the course of our day, how are a bunch of ordinary people gonna see extraordinary things happen in our midst, how are we gonna pull that off? Well, we can't pull that off. We don't have the means, we don't have the resources in and of ourselves. But if we will but trust God, if we will but believe God for big things, if we will just literally get out of the way and, and put aside distractions and limitations that sometimes hinder us, I believe with all my heart that God will do the extraordinary through us. How many are candidates for that? How many want to see God do some amazing things? You know, the reality is that God is always calling his people to do things that their own resources could never accomplish on their own. As we read through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, we constantly see that God never calls the church to mediocre living. He never calls his people to believe him for things that they can accomplish on their own strength. God is always challenging us to believe him to do things that we can't possibly pull off so that our view of God gets much bigger than our limitations tend to cause us to look at. And so I pray this morning that as we, as we take a look at this text, I, I pray that we would see what God can do through people who are willing to give them what they have so that God might provide in us and through us what our culture needs. If you have your Bibles with you, we see a great example of, of this in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, let's take a look at that. And picking up at verse 13, Matthew chapter 14. In verse 13, it was interesting, I had to fly out to, um, um, I had a meeting in Delaware last week. And in my 
for a guy who travels so much, I am so geographically challenged. It's, it's really amazing how I get anywhere. Um, I thought, <laughs> so if you, if you feel like you're geographically challenged, you're gonna really feel you're geographically challenged when I tell you what I thought. I thought the quickest way to Del Delaware would be to fly to Baltimore <laughs> and then drive over there. And so I fly into Baltimore and then get my rental car and I've got to drive 70 miles towards New York to get to where I've got to go. And I'm driving the car and I'm thinking, what an idiot. Like I could have, so I'm going back and forth, that's 140 miles. The trip from here to Delaware is only 180. But Taylor, I shared that with Taylor and he came through big for me, encouraged me. He said, because here's what happened. I got on the plane and I opened up my, my Bible and I just started going, I went to this text just to spend some time in the word. And all of a sudden these thoughts just, so God just started giving me something out of that. And it was like, I started writing notes and taking notes and seeing things I'd never seen before. And, and boom, I'm like, I'm preaching this next Sunday when I get to, which if I was driving, that never would have happened. And so, you know what? Interestingly, sometimes the longer way is the quicker way. Um, and so God knows how to get our attention. And so uh, Matthew chapter 14, I pray that the Holy Spirit really uh, lands this deep in our hearts so that we could believe God for big things. Matthew chapter 14, look at verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Conservatively, 10 to 12,000 people were there that day. What an extraordinary story that we, we, we hone in on this morning and, and see Jesus do an extraordinary thing. A couple of things that kind of popped into my, my mind as I was going through this text and I just, just the opening passage. Now, let me just tell you, anytime you're reading through the scriptures, and you come across an opening passage that begins something like, when Jesus heard this, I wanna encourage you to make sure that you go back and consider what did he just hear, right? Because we don't wanna get like something, there's a link between what just happened and what is about to happen right here. There's a bridge. And so this passage opens up and says, now when Jesus heard this, there's something very significant that Jesus just heard. And it's in this that we, we see the, the humanity of Jesus on display, and we also see the selflessness of Jesus on display. When Jesus heard this, heard what? Jesus had gotten news that, that his cousin, that his childhood friend, John the Baptist, was just beheaded. His friend, his, the one who he grew up with, the forerunner, of his ministry, the prophet that the scripture makes reference to, the one that he, I'm sure, played with as a child and grew with and, and was in communion with. Word gets to Jesus that he had just been beheaded. And when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Why? because he wanted to be alone. Jesus just heard some devastating news and he was grieving for his friend. That's real. I think we don't know that, we don't, you know, we, we know, we know this clearly that, that Jesus knew of the resurrection, obviously, but we have a snapshot into the humanity of Jesus here. 
In the same way that when they told him that Lazarus died, the scripture says he, he wept. And now Jesus hears about his childhood friend, John the Baptist, is beheaded, and he pulls away from the crowd to be by himself. And while seeking to be alone, Jesus sees something that is greater than his grief. Jesus sees something, Jesus sees a need that is greater than his need to be alone right now. He sees the crowd. Wow. I mean, if there was ever a time that Jesus had a right to say, not today. I mean, everywhere Jesus went, crowds gathered. Everywhere Jesus went, needs were put before him. Everywhere Jesus went, the crowds would come and they would expect from him. And Jesus would always deliver. But if there was ever a time where Jesus had the right to say, not today, I think today is the day. But Jesus saw something greater than the grief that was in his heart. He desired to be, put, to be away by himself, but then he looked and he saw the crowd. And that crowd that he saw, the scripture says, then he was moved with compassion. He didn't just see the crowd like I see you and you see me today. He saw the crowd. He saw their needs. He saw they were broken. He saw that they were hungry. He saw that they were sick and they were in need. He identified with them. That's what compassion is. You step into the journey with that person and you feel what they're feeling. And when Jesus sees the crowd, he puts his own grief aside. He puts his own rights to be alone aside. And he is moved with compassion. And that moving of compassion now calls him to do something about it. He heals their sick. I love this. What Jesus was going through internally, didn't knock him off mission, didn't stop him from doing what he was called to do. Now there's times that we need to pull away. There's times we need to put things on hold, right? But what we see here in Jesus is a willingness to stay on mission. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And in the midst of his grief, he he, he didn't turn it off because you can't turn off grief, but he ministered through it. He walked into their skin, their journey, put on their moccasins, if you will, and he began to meet the needs. Oh, that we would not get so distracted from the things that we're going through, the things that we're feeling, the challenges of life, the busy schedule, the, all the things that so many times, and listen, man, I'm just as busy as every one of you are. And the reality is, if we're not careful, it's so easy for us to not see the crowd. It's so easy for us to, to be so focused on what we need to do that we can fail to see the needs of people around us. And what we see modeled for us in Jesus is the one who was grieving and in the midst of his pain, he stopped and he saw the crowd. And he allowed what he saw to be felt by him. There's some times that I'll see needs that can I tell you to my shame, I just got to turn it off because I just think I can't go there. I don't have the juice. I can't, if I can't fix it, I don't want to think about it. Jesus never did that. He felt what they were feeling. He was moved with compassion. We see the selflessness of Jesus. We see the, the compassion of Jesus. And, and then we see the power of Jesus. He sees the crowd, he's moved by the crowd, and then he begins to meet the needs. We, start to, we see Jesus healing their sick. And how many know that there was more than one or two that day? I mean, when they, when they heard Jesus was in town, the crowds came and they brought the sick with them. 
They knew that when Jesus came to town, people left healed. And Jesus, one after one, began to heal their sick all throughout the course of the day. And so we see, we see the power of Jesus. We see the compassion of Jesus. We, we see the selflessness of Jesus modeled for us. And then we see something very interesting here. In addition to meeting the needs of healing the sick, and I think that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good need that was met by Jesus. But it didn't stop there, right? We see Jesus continuing to meet a need of the broader crowd, of the, of the entire crowd. We, we see a plan that Jesus puts in place in order to meet the needs of the people. Look at what it says here in verse 15. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Do you love that? I love the fact the disciples are very practical. Right, no nonsense. Hey, Jesus, you know, it's been a long day. It's getting a little dark and we are in the middle of nowhere. I don't see a bakery around. Do you see a bakery around? There's no way. They're, they're gonna get hungry. And when people get hungry, they tend to get a little, a little annoying, right? And so, and so maybe, maybe they're looking and thinking, you know what, before we have a problem on our hands, Jesus, why don't you send them away because we have no way in order to meet their need, send them away so they can go into the city and they can buy food to feed themselves. That makes all the sense in the world. And Jesus comes up with a better plan. Jesus says, you know what? You feed them. Don't you love when you have this great idea of what needs to be done by somebody else and you say, you know, here's what I think you should do. And then they turn it around and they say, that's a great idea. Can you do that? Let me know how it works out. I love doing that, by the way. I love when, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to point out things that need to change around here and grow and develop. And so when people come up with good ideas, I'm like, that's really great. If God gave you the wisdom to come up with the idea, God will give you the grace to accomplish the task. And so you feed them. Wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall at that point if there was one where when Jesus kind of spins it on them and says, you know what, you feed them. <laughs> There's 10,000 people here. <laughs> Jeez, I, and I love what they say here. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's getting dark. The day, he says it, the day is now over. <laughs> And Jesus is like, <laughs> the day is just beginning. Wait until you see. You see, sometimes, what did they just do? They put a limit on what Jesus can do. They, they reviewed all the facts. They considered all the needs. They looked at all their resources and they came to the conclusion, there's nothing more you can do, Jesus. Send them home. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, well, we only have two fish and five loaves of bread. What is that to so many? Jesus... <laughs> There's no way we are, we are gonna be able to meet the need. There's no way we're gonna be able to do what you're asking us to do. I love this, let me tell you something. God will never call you to do something that he does not give you the grace and the ability to accomplish. What should have sprung up, and maybe it did, I don't know, I don't wanna look into the text too much, but maybe when Jesus said to them, listen, you know what, you feed them, perhaps something sprung up in their hearts, they thought, God's gonna do something right here. Because Jesus would have never called us to feed them if he wasn't going to do that God thing right now, and we're all gonna see a miracle, we're gonna eat like kings. I don't know what was going on in their mind. If they're anything like me, they're probably thinking, how are you gonna pull that off? And then look what Jesus says. They say to him, listen, here's the limits, Jesus. Here's the problem. The problem is they're really hungry. They've been here all day and we only have two fish and five loaves. And Jesus says, Bring them here to me. I love that. 
What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, give me what you have and I'll give you what you need. I told you to feed them. And I'm not going to tell you to feed them if I'm not going to give you the resources to pull it off. Jesus, here's what we have. And Jesus says, good. Give me what you have and I will give you what you need. We see here the the provision of Jesus. We see the limitations of the disciples, the limitations of their resources, the awareness that they can't pull this off. But we see the command of Jesus and the invitation of Jesus. Give me what you have. And look what happens here. He brings them to there. Now we see the provision of Jesus. It says, then he, he broke the loaves and he gave them to who? The disciples. Jesus didn't distribute the bread to the people. Jesus gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And so the miracle, the resources come from Jesus to the disciples, from the disciples to the people where the need is being so great. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And look, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. Isn't that amazing? I mean, what we see here is that God takes their limited resources and he does a miracle. And because it filters through Jesus, the need is met. And those two fish and five loaves become enough to feed a crowd of 10,000 plus people. And they are full. They are satisfied. We see here that the bread is multiplied. We see then that the bread, the bread is distributed. Now, I don't know how the bread was multiplied, where, where and all that kind of took place. You know, maybe as they, they handed one out, another one popped up. And they handed out another one. Would you love to have seen how God did this? I mean, it must have been, and they must have been like, you know, imagine the first one, or maybe the sixth one, right? They had five loaves, right? Or maybe the 11th one, because they broke them in half, right? And who knows how they did it? But when they knew that they were coming to the end, somehow, some way, it just became available. And they're like, well, check this out. I'm not running out. It's still coming. It's still coming. Look, there's enough for everybody. You want doubles? You want triples? Whatever you want. It looks like we have more than enough, right? We see the bread is multiplied. It's distributed. We see that it's plentiful. It says they had as much as they wanted. Now, I don't know if there's any Italians in the group that were there that day. I don't know who was there. But I'll tell you, I'm sure that if all they had all day was bread, man, they must have ate like Gavones that day. They must have had so much. They, they were so full. They had leftovers. Very interesting. This is very significant, what we see going on here. Because this bread that they are distributing, it is miraculously provided It it comes from God. It is plentiful. And it is sufficient to satisfy their hunger that day. He satisfies the needs of the people that day. Does that cause you to think back a little further into the Old Testament and journeying backwards all the way to the book of Exodus? As the people of God, they, they leave Egypt, right? After all of the plagues, like let my people go. And they finally get set free and they're heading in the direction towards the wilderness. They are set free. They've seen God, God's power on display. And now the people of Israel, they're going, but they're, as they are going, they're getting hungry. And as they're getting hungry, they're starting to complain, They're complaining about Moses. They're complaining about God. They're complaining about one another. They are complaining. It's an amazing thing considering all the things that just took place in Egypt. And now they are going and they're complaining to Moses that we are hungry. They're like, listen, man, did God bring us out of Egypt into the wilderness to kill us? Better that we would have stayed in Egypt in slavery. At least we would have had something to eat. 
Very interesting what God does here. Exodus chapter 16 and verse four. It says, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. I said in the first service, that's the difference between God and me. Because if it was me, if I had to be really honest with you, if I just did everything that God did to the people, for the people of Israel through Egypt, and I heard more grumbling and more complaining, what would have rained out of heaven would not have been bread. It would have been bricks. Right? It would, it would have been fire. It would have been wrath. I'm like, are you kidding me? But no, God is far more gracious than I ever could be. And so look what he says here. God says, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every single day. And every morning that they would wake up, there would be fresh manna, fresh bread on the ground, and they would gather up all that they wanted in the course of the day. There would be enough to meet every need that they had. And what was amazing, Amazing was on Saturday, twice as much was present so they can gather up for enough for Sunday so they can celebrate the Sabbath without gathering more bread. We see an amazing miracle that God provides here. But what does he do here? We see that this manna from heaven, likewise, it came from heaven, right? It came from, it came down from heaven. It came from God. We see that it was plentiful and it was satisfying. God is meeting the need of his people in Exodus chapter 16, as well as this, this crowd of people that we see in Matthew chapter 14. God knows how to fill the hunger of his creation. In John chapter 6, John writes about this same miracle that we read about in Matthew chapter 14. As you look at each of the gospels, each of the gospels will share about the life and ministry of Jesus and they will each cover different aspects of that. They never contradict one another. It's kind of looking at the same story through different lenses because each of the gospels were written by different authors and written to different people. And so depending on who the recipient of the gospel was, they would bring in different highlights of the, the story to help it um, help it make a maximum impact. And so John, in writing this, uh, uh, re uh, recalling the same scene um, that we read about in Matthew chapter 14, John talks about it in John chapter six. And what's interesting is what John does is he, he highlights it or he connects what Jesus just did. He tells the other part of the story that Matthew doesn't include it, but John includes it because John's gospel is written to all the world. And so John includes that there's a connection between what just happened in the, in the feeding of the 5,000 to what took place in Exodus chapter 16. Don't you love how the, 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 the Old and New Testaments connect one with another? And so what John is doing is he's highlighting that there's a connection with what they experienced that day with Jesus is like what they experienced back in Exodus 16, but so much more. John chapter six and verse 32, John, said, John writes and says, and Jesus says to them, this is after the miracle, right? He's after, he goes, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. That's referring to what took place in Exodus chapter 16. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Wait a minute, now we're talking about different kind of bread, right? They're talking about something you eat. Now Jesus is talking about true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This bread is unlike the bread they experienced under Moses. The bread they got from Moses, it came from God and went to the stomach, but it pointed to a day where another bread was going to come down and this was going to be sent by the Father and this bread was going to give life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. It continues on in verse 48. He says, look, I am the bread of life. Your father is the eight manna in the wilderness and they're dead. Right, he's making the connection. There is the connection. Listen, what your fathers experienced, the bread that went to their stomach, eventually they died. But look what he says here. 
But this bread, speaking of himself, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is making the connection that what was experienced in Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 16, what they experienced in John chapter 6 and experienced in in Matthew chapter 14, and they actually experienced it again in Matthew chapter 16 with 4,000 people. What Jesus is saying is those were shadows. Those were symbols that would point you to another bread that is fully, that is going to come, that is fully capable of satisfying not just your stall, not just your stomach, but your entire life. He that eats of this bread shall never die. Something interesting, going back to Matthew, that Matthew points out there in um, in verse, um, verse 19, look, it says, Matthew 14, 19 says, look, then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Matthew makes a, 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 a point to mention that, that Jesus took it and and, 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 and broke the bread. Why would you break the bread? I mean, the reality of it is, if, if, if you were to come over in my house, when we were growing up, we'd get the nice Prostano's Italian, remember that loaf of bread? You're just like, you talk about bread from heaven. Oof, that was unbelievable. But man, me and my four brothers, right, we, we, that would come, and like everybody would have their eye on the loaf. And so what we would do is, we'd break it up very evenly, the corner of the end would go to mom and, and then everything else, right? We kind of separate, everybody get their piece. And so we'd break it up so that there was enough for everybody. But what Jesus is doing here, he's multiplying the bread anyway. Why spread it out? Why break the bread? Why, why the need to ensure that there's enough for everybody? Or maybe... Maybe there's a message in that. Because this same Jesus, who was present in Exodus chapter 16 at the provision of the manna, this same Jesus who multiplied the bread in chapter 14, this same Jesus who also broke, uh, multiplied bread in Matthew 16, is the same one who sat in front of his disciples and once again broke the bread and said, this is my body. It's broken for you. In that action, in that moment of the miracle where Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and his disciples gave it to the crowd and they gathered up the broken pieces It pointed to the one who would come, whose body would be broken for us. Jesus, like the like the manna in Exodus, like the loaves and fish in Matthew fourteen. Jesus came down from heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I am the bread of life that's come down from heaven. Like the other bread, Jesus came down from heaven. Like the others, he was provided for us. Because like they, we have needs. 
Theirs that we looked at was a physical hunger, but man from creation since the fall has a spiritual hunger that only the bread of life can satisfy. And so he was provided for us. And like all the bread that was left over, that was so abundant, likewise, everything that Jesus did for us is more than enough. And like the bread that was so plentiful to the disciples and the crowd, and to the crowd in Egypt, so too the bread of life satisfies our soul. Nothing, listen, bread, physical bread can satisfy our stomach for a little while. Jobs, toys, relationships, all these different things that people go after to try to satisfy that hunger within every one of those things falls so short. There is only one thing that will satisfy the hunger of humanity, and that is when creation connects with creator through the person of Jesus Christ, the one who came down from heaven, the bread of life. He satisfies our soul. So much in that. The people, the people had a need that day on the mountain. They had a need that the disciples couldn't provide. They didn't have the resources. They, they didn't have enough. And so the lesson to them is the same as the lesson to us. Give God what you have and he'll give you what you need. How will we reach the world for Jesus with with a couple of loaves and some fish? How will we reach the world for Jesus with the limited amount of time that we have in the course of our week? How will we reach the world for Jesus with the limited resources we have in the bank? How will we reach the world for Jesus with the limited things that we really know? How will we, we can be so paralyzed by our own limitations in the same way the disciples were, or we could look and say, you know what? Here's what I got. It's only a couple of fish, a couple of loaves, certainly not enough to feed everybody, but if I give it to Jesus, I'll give Jesus what I have, and listen, Jesus will take it and multiply it and use it to give everybody what they need. And what does the world need? It's interesting that Jesus didn't feed the crowd. Jesus provided the disciples with what they needed to accomplish the task of feeding the crowd. And as Jesus ascended into heaven, he left us with a mission to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. How in the world are we going to do that? We're going to take our two loaves, our five loaves and our two fish, and we're going to give it to Jesus. And interestingly, Jesus provided bread for them. What are we providing? We're providing the bread of life. We're providing the only one the same one who stepped into our life and saved us and brought purpose and and forgiveness and a sense of value and importance to our lives, that one who brought dignity back into our lives. It is Christ and Christ alone. There's nothing else that the world needs and there's nothing else that we could possibly provide for the world. Give God what you have. He'll give us, he'll give us what we need. But too many times, we look at our calendars, we look at our resources, we look at our demands, we look at all the things that we have to do and we just say, I just got two fish and five loaves, I'm not even gonna bother. And that very insignificant amount 
of resource was enough to meet the need. How are we going to impact this area for Jesus Christ? We're just going to get a couple of fish and loaves and do what we can do. You say, you don't understand, Pastor. I am too busy. Then you're too busy. You're too busy. If there's no capacity in your schedule, if there's no space in your calendar to do what God's called you to do, then you've made an idol out of those things that are pulling you away from God. Whether it be job or whatever it may be, find the space to find those two fish and five loaves in your life and give them to Jesus. And as you give them, as you give them to Jesus, he'll, he'll multiply them. He'll do a great thing in us and, and through us. So this morning, as we, as we come to communion, I thought, let's do communion a little bit different. I asked the worship team if they come at this time. I figured, let's mix it up a little, and let's make it real personal. What does the bread of life mean to you? Who is the bread of life in your, in your life? In a moment, I'm going to have you come this morning and partake of a piece of bread. You can take as big a piece or as small a piece as you want. Don't eat it here. Just grab a piece of bread and grab the cup as you're... I want you to go back to your seat. I want you to close out the world of everybody around you. And just consider... Consider what Jesus has done for you. Consider where you're at in your walk with Christ. Consider if there's areas in your life that you have missed the mark. Communion is a great reminder that forgiveness is possible because of Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't put his finger on areas of our life that need to change to make us feel guilty. He puts his finger on those areas so that we find forgiveness and wholeness and can walk in the destiny that God has for us. And when you've had your time with the Lord, you can partake of the elements, maintaining in a heart of attitude of worship, and then we're going to kind of flow back into worship again together. I love to connect the dots. We have the manna in the Old Testament that pointed to the manna that was going to come down on the mountain through the miraculous hands of Jesus. And Jesus provides the bread, and then Jesus breaks the bread. He, he gathers with his disciples And he says, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I love the genius of God and having us come back regularly to the table to celebrate that moment of communion, that time, because sometimes we forget and we can get so, we can beat ourselves up so easily and get so consumed with where we're at that we forget that Christ came and he died on a cross for you and for me so that we can be forgiven of our sins. If we'll confess our sins, the scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything that needs to be done for your forgiveness was done on Calvary. It was done out of love for you and me. And so we come back to the table and we remember his body that was broken. We remember his blood that was shed, the only means by which the wrath of God would be satisfied for the sin of the world. And we're reminded that we can find forgiveness in Jesus. Jesus.
And so we come. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not, you've not partaken of the bread of life. Maybe, maybe, you, you're before, maybe before you partake of the symbol of the bread, you need to partake of the person of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never asked Christ to come into your life to forgive you of your sins and, and to literally be the Lord of your life. It means, to, it means to let Jesus be in the driver's seat of your life and let his love for you drive you in the course of your life. Maybe, maybe today is your day. So what do you do? You, the quietness of your heart, ask Jesus, just forgive me my sins. I recognize I'm a sinner. I ask that you forgive me and you come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. And then come as a reminder that that's only possible because of his body that was broken and his blood that was shed for us. Or maybe, maybe you've done that. Maybe you've, maybe you've crossed over the line and, and you're, you're just, but you're just not where you know you need to be. Maybe the cares of the world and the, the desires of the flesh and all the, the things of life have gotten in the way and it's kind of got you off track and maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're listening online or, or on TV and you're thinking, you know what, I need, I need to get right with God. That journey is not far. If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us. So forgiveness is found in Jesus. Not in religious ritual, and just asking for forgiveness. And so our worship team is going to play, and let's maintain a, an attitude of worship this morning, and I invite you to, to come and partake together.